Hello, I'm Paul Briley, and you're listening to Off the Comma. I'm a human who cares about supporting other humans. On this podcast, we'll explore all facets of what it means to feel stuck in life. We talk with people just like us who have found themselves sitting on a comma and not knowing where to go next. We'll unpack the experience with them, where they've been stuck, what it feels like, what they experienced, and what they learned. My goal is to inspire you by seeing yourself in others. I believe that when we feel more connected and seen, magic can happen. So I am so excited to have Tony here with us today. Tony Warsdahl is a new friend of mine and a new friend of mine from the UK. And we've only known each other since like end of March, early April. So I'm, I'm really excited not only to hear your story, as I always do, am excited to hear everybody's story, but yours in particular, because I haven't really known you for very long. So I'm going to learn a little bit more about you. And I think we're going to deepen our friendship today. Tony, tell us a little bit about yourself. How would you like to be known and what would be important for people to know about you? I guess, um, I, guess I, I suppose, you know, professionally, I'm a project manager, change management that sort of thing. I've worked in the public sector for most of my career and I'm coming to the end, towards the end of my career. And I've sort of been someone who can get things done. I think, you know, that's what most project managers do. And that sort of probably relates to my private life as well as my my professional life. But that, you know, work isn't just everything for me. I'm also a proud grandfather to 10 grandchildren, which is uh, a great source of joy and challenge. But uh, something that I I really enjoy. Also, more, most lately, and probably how I'm becoming known now is I've retrained as a sober coach um, to work with people who've already made up uh, made up their mind to change their relationship with alcohol, uh, and that's sort of becoming a, a bit of how I'm known now, uh, and natural progression I think from what I've done previously, where ultimately I've helped people make decisions. Uh, in their professional lives and moved people towards consensus and actions based upon that consensus. Well, it sounds like, you know, family is important to you. And it sounds like in your in your roles, both your historical career and also the directions you're going now, it sounds like you're uh, a bit of a facilitator. Would that be a fair word to use? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, whether it's in business or in your personal life, I think getting people to a point of consensus has always been something mm. that I've striven to to achieve. I think, you know, particularly in, in the business world, if the stakeholders don't agree on things, then actually the end result is not going to be very easy to achieve. So, mm. yeah, building a rapport and, and getting um, the, the teams to uh, to agree where they're going and what their goals are has been a large part of what I do. And then apply that to that some sort of, project management type logic, if you like, to, you know, once you've identified the tasks or the, the objectives, the goals, then actually getting them done, I guess, is what I, what I am. I, a bit of a complete finisher, I think. And if you were going to pick, you know, another one or two words to kind of describe yourself overall, what would those words be? I think I'm a very genuine man, a very, very keen on living to my values and, um, you know, living my whole life by that, so I, I suppose I, I'm true to myself, um, and I would like other people to believe it or to think of me that way as well. So, Tony, as we get into our conversation today, you know, kind of just a reminder for anyone listening, you know, we, you and I haven't talked about what you're going to be sharing today, and and we do that to keep it real and authentic and unscripted and unrehearsed. And I'm excited to hear what you have to share. What's your what would be your intention? For yourself for this conversation my, my intention would be really to share my experiences of what it has been like for me in recent years to get stuck um and the approaches i've taken both in professional and personal life to get unstuck or in your terms off the comma ball and i think that's the thing i want to share with a particular emphasis in this latter part of my career around the sober coaching because for me that is, is the most significant, not just in my life now, but also the thing that I think I'd like to get over in this uh, this conversation about the value of that. Definitely an intention there, and I appreciate you sharing that. My intention for our conversation today is 
as always, to hold space for you to be able to to share your story and and speak your experience with hopes that that inspires someone else who might be listening and that it helps someone else feel a little bit more connected, a little bit less alone. And, and also that perhaps you walk away from this experience with something else as well. I'm, I'm discovering, you know, the more episodes we do, the more comments I get from guests that it's like, wow, I ended up walking away with something from that, or, you know, that ended up feeling a certain way for me. And and so that's, that's been powerful. I'm, I'm hoping that is the case for you as well. I'm sure it will be Paul. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm over, I'm, I, l- I love to learn things and I, you know, use whole of life as a, as a way of learning. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to learn something from this experience, probably about myself as well as, as anything else. So, yeah, I'm, I'm open to that. All right, Tony. So you and I had already talked about this in in in, uh, in a prior conversation as to how the, the conversation would flow. I've got five questions for you, and that's just the skeleton or the framework for for the conversation. So let's jump in with the first question: Where have you found yourself sitting on a comma in your life? Probably quite a few times, I guess, is, is the answer. But I think you know, rather than go back over the you know X number of years of, of experience, I think. Probably the last ten years are, are the ones that are probably relevant. I think my first real getting stuck, um, although inherent in the job that I do, uh, I'm always unsticking people. So you would think some of these things would be clear and easy for me. But my my first big occasion for that was around about uh, 2010, when my business was in a position as a lot of businesses were when the first global crisis occurred uh the business that i was in you know went from having 12 employees and you know a good revenue stream to almost falling off the edge of a cliff and you know many businesses folded theirs mine didn't but i was stuck for a period of probably four months when i was deciding what I should do about the employees in the business. And that was a very difficult time because, it, you know, although my business, I've been in business probably 25, 30 years now, um, it was the first time I'd really experienced that sort of, what well, do I make people redundant and do these people that mean a lot to me because they've worked with me for many years, what's, what's right for them? So I, I can recall distinctly that was a really difficult uh, time for me. Financially, it was because we weren't earning, but I was still paying out. And, you know, I'm sure Paul is a, as a, your own, and running your own business, you know, when your outgoings exceed your income, you should be doing something different. But I, I sat around for too long worried about the people that were working for me rather than thinking pragmatically about the way forward and the way out of that situation. So that was the first occasion. Yeah, that worried me quite a lot. That made me feel a bit powerless. What was what was the hardest part of that? I mean, we can we can make assumptions based on all of our own experiences, and that sounds like it's you know a very difficult and challenging situation to be in. But what was difficult about it for you specifically? I suppose that the difficulty is like anything in business. Until you've done it, it all seems hard. When you've done these things a few times, you you learn by them and they can come easy. So the, the first difficulty is I've never done it before. But hey, when you run your own business, you probably have that nearly every other day of the week because there's always something. Mm-hmm. So that, that was the first challenge. The second challenge was that the people that were around me had either worked with me or for me for probably 20, 25 years, uh, all had their own uh, different circumstances that you know I was considering. Uh, before making moves about the business. Uh, and I suppose the third difficulty was I really knew that actually the solution was to make people redundant, to cut my overheads and change the business model. And that was, those were the difficulties I faced. Yeah. And just to clarify for listeners in other countries, particularly the US, my frame of when you say making people redundant, that's what we call layoffs over here. Yeah. Um, and so basically having to let people go from their positions, which is very difficult. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was a, a, a quite a traumatic time. And I, I can still remember the, the unease and the feelings I felt around that. What um, what did that create for you? You you kind of already started answering that question. You said the unease and the feelings that you had around that. Like, what did this experience create for you? It created, yeah. You know, I mean, 
that whole sort of anxiety around that was, you know, was one of the big problems. I, I guess, you know, in the business I was running, it's a consultancy business. We, um, you know, it's all about people with people and how do you motivate people when you're sort of uh, saying to them, well, this could be your last job, et cetera. So it, managing and motivating the people in the team is quite challenging, but also knowing that perhaps the business aspirations I have for my company were not going to be realised. You know, I, I'd mm. set out a plan, you know, a, a mm. five-year plan where we needed to get to, um, and we were well on the way to doing that. Suddenly we face with a situation where, because of circumstances outside your control, that wasn't going to happen. That that was uh, yeah, a personal challenge for me because I'd never experienced that. That was sort of almost rocking my foundations about, you know, Am I good enough for this sort of thing? Yeah. Well, and I want to acknowledge you for that because even within this particular situation, you're speaking about these multiple levels of experiences, right? There's the this tactical level ex- of experience of you know monitoring the books and and having to react and respond to you know the the income and the expenses of the organization and may have to make these staffing decisions and then you're talking about what does that say about me as a person you know and like you said this is hard because it's the first time i've experienced it or haven't been through this before and what does it say about me and my ability you said i believe you said maybe i'm not cut out for this yes yeah, absolutely absolutely and, that, and those are themes i think that have run through my experiences for a number of years until fairly recently where you know, I've sort of realized that uh, you can be good enough and good enough is good enough. So, so I think that was that uncertainty at first time. And you know, it, it had a lasting effect on me because once I'd found a solution to that, I made sure I never got in that situation again. Well, I tried to, that's the second part of the story. <laughs> it, okay. it did happen again, but there you go. Okay. Well, so let's let's unpack just a little bit more that that first part of the story and then we'll we'll jump into the next question here in a moment. But so the situations come up for you and and what it's creating for you is you know this anxiety as you mentioned and this this questioning of kind of your abilities, capabilities, identity. And then you said it did show up again later and we'll come back to that. But you said something about like taking steps, these aren't the words you use, but you you took steps to kind of prevent it from happening, at least before before it happened again. Yeah, and I, I think in the business context, then I I, um, I had some very good professional advice. Um, I had a non-executive chairman in my business uh, who guided me through some of that, and I think you know that that's one of the things I learned that you doesn't matter whether you're the chief executive or whatever you like to call them, there is always um, some benefit in seeking external guidance. You know, and I guess that's why a lot of CEOs have business coaches now, because it's it's one of those those sort of um, acceptable aids to business, I think, that, you know, quite a few people find difficulty in accepting. And, and yeah, that, that knocks on into the second part of the story. But uh, having had that advice and seeing the way that I could um, ensure my business survived, um, not in the same format, but, you know, survived and it's, st- it's still okay. running. That was sort of, that was the light at the end of the tunnel and the things that it then made me aware of and made me ensure that I did or didn't do it again. Those were the key things. And the, the sing, you know, the I guess the single thing that sort of resonates through all of mm. that is a and you'd probably say is getting off the comma quicker so make that decision tough as it may be whatever that decision is you know Mm. spend time considering but don't procrastinate because as soon as you you know certainly for me as soon as i'd made the decision to act um and let the people go that made a a huge change for me not just in my own personal self-esteem and anxiety but it also indicated to me that I was good enough to make those tough business decisions, which actually made a lot of difference in the the recovery plan of the business. Mm-hmm. Because although I never returned to 
employing 12 people, we worked through the subcontracting model then, which, you know, is, is very common now and it's probably the way that smaller businesses survive. What it did for me was effectively ensure that I never got to the position where, in reality, I was paying people out of my own personal money. You know, I, I was putting, you know, other people's families before my own, mm-hmm. which, you know, is what I, yeah, that's me. Uh, but that wasn't, you know, that wasn't serving me or my family particularly well. So actually being able to make those tough decisions, you know, as quickly as they need to be made, that was the big lesson I learned out of that. Well, and I hear that and, and you really illustrate, you know, another facet of, of this, you know, multi complex type of scenario whenever people find themselves sitting on a comma. And I hear you describing, you know, this, this comma created anxiety and stress for you. It put you in a very difficult decision, a situation, difficult decisions to make and questioning your identity and, and, and some of your beliefs and expectations. And, and when you realize that it was finally time to take some action, as you specifically said, in your case, a sense of urgency was an important part of that. So, as you said, once I decided to take action, then I had to move quickly and I learned a lot from that experience and your, your goal, your, your outcome that you had set for yourself was to try to pre- prevent this same type of situation from happening again. And it wasn't easy. No, no, but then you know, any decisions in business, when you're making them in your own business, most decisions are, are always a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Now you said there's a second part to the story. So before I go to our next question, like you said, it, but it did happen again. And there's another part to the story. What, what came next? Well, the, 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 that, that sort of, I suppose the, the main part of the story is as I approached, um, you know, towards the beginning of 2020. And at that stage, considering um, retirement, whatever that means, you know, I'm 67. And, you know, I don't know when I'm going to retire, if I'm going to retire, but, you know, there's a, there's a sort of process you go through um, working out you know, how much time you need, how much money you need, et cetera. All those things were in my mind. And at the time uh, I was considering all of that, I was not struggling with, I was contemplating my relationship with alcohol. Mm. And Mm. I had, despite the fact that I'd sort of learned these lessons, you know, previously about making decisions quickly, this is one that I couldn't make quickly. Um, I think. For me, the journey towards making a decision to stop drinking alcohol was probably took me three years. Um, so you know, to make a quick decision, you know, here I am saying make a quick decision and, and get off the comma. This one probably took me a lot longer. And yeah, you know, we would talk about that process, but it was at the beginning of 2020 when I could see possible retirement looming. Uh, which probably meant more time than I had available to myself. Um, being a, you know, someone who drunk alcohol for 50 years or so, you know, I would have more time. I would have a reasonable income, more time, more money. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, and that was the point where just before lockdown, um, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't the pandemic that spurred me on, but just before that sort of became a reality. I made this decision to to um, stop drinking alcohol and and haven't you know for three and a half years. So the lessons learned of the previous decade and you know the things that I did um, in my own personal and private life and professionally about getting decisions made quickly, it took me a little bit longer to make this one. But I think it's probably the one decision that I will never regret. And it's one that I think does take however long it takes to get there. What I'm hearing you say is, yeah, there was a difference in that earlier situation and this one in terms of how long it took me to make the decision. But it seems like it's almost not important to the story. Or is it? I think it's a a sort of rationalization of a principle in a sense that the principle that I think I, I, I sort of adopted throughout my private and my per- my professional career is now is about making timely decisions quickly 
I think that's the when it came to the personal decision about uh, stopping drinking alcohol. I think it was a timely period. Three years was probably a timely period because during that time, I had to go through a number of different things that uh, all seemed appropriate at the time. But it, but I suppose the the sort of and it's probably uh, part of the next question that, or a further question might be talking about, Paul, is that actually getting off that comma in that occasion was just hugely um, beneficial. And I think, you know, the, the, the result of getting off of the comma if, and getting unstuck in all of those scenarios were all equally beneficial. But that single one that took me longer to, to, to make has changed my life completely. Yeah. What, what you, you touched on it a little bit. What, what ultimately made you make the decision beyond what you've already shared? What else would you add to that? The biggest thing was probably I had just come to the realization that I'd had enough, that I had enough of the anxiety or the, the, the difficulty, the mental torture, if you'd like to say, of knowing whether or not I could or I couldn't, whether, you know, today was a drinking day or not a drinking day. And the realization that I was probably afraid of stopping drinking alcohol. And to me, that, mm-hmm. that was a sort of uh, a point where I just thought, well, this is, this is going to change. And for me, that, you know, it just happened that 6th of January in 2020, I took my last drink. And it, you know, it has changed my life completely. And, you know, I think it's, it's something that uh, I wish I'd, I'd made the decision earlier, but I sort of don't think I could have done. It, it's interesting. I'm going to kind of interject my own kind of curiosity here because, you know, you mentioned quitting in January of 2020, quitting drinking in January of 2020 after a three year process that you said was took you a little bit longer to make that decision than other really monumental decisions in your past, as you've already shared with us. And yet you did that. And how many people really started like deepening or, or really getting into their relationship with alcohol as a result of the pandemic, right? Like here you are quitting in January. I mean, let's just be, let's just be blunt. You're quitting in January and, and staying alcohol free through the pandemic when we were watching every day starting in March people celebrating day drinking cuz they're working from home and and now how many people are kind of really having their own uh reckoning with their relationship with alcohol as a result of the pandemic so that's just it's just interesting so how did you how did you maintain it yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it did feel quite strange to start with because, as you say, everyone else was talking to were like, "Yeah, happy days." You know, we just we've just got more drinking time, and so the early days were quite difficult, um, but not not terrible because I knew that what it meant for me, and I think I did sort of hunker down on what was important for me at the time, not everyone else. So, yeah, it was, it was strange, and I had to sort of stand back and watch some of my dear friends sort of descend into that habit uh, a little bit further than I would have liked to have seen and and Mm -hmm. probably they would have liked to have seen. Thankfully, most of them have have overcome that. But, you know, dry January in that particular year wasn't very dry for many people. Mm -hmm. Well, Tony, on that topic, though, elaborate for us, if you will. Like, what was the thing that was clear to you that you held on to that kept you committed to your vision while everybody else was descending into day drinking, pandemic drinking? I think, I think it was about a belief that I was doing the right thing for me. And I was making a journey towards the person that I was meant to be. Mm. Because I think I had like many used alcohol as a way of numbing out things that either I didn't want to think about or I didn't want to contemplate or or whatever. And I think, you know, during that period, what I became aware of is that there was an authentic me that I lost, you know, a good few years ago that was coming back. And I think it was that thing I held on to. And to anchor that for me, the, the biggest point was I actually, I had to tell someone about that. 
because being accountable to yourself is one thing, but being accountable to someone else, I think is always a challenge, not just in, in sobriety, but also in many other aspects of life. So, and again, because it's such a personal thing, it, I found it hard to tell people that I knew very well, including my wife, that I'd made that decision. But, I, you know, it, it's a, it was a difficult, an odd thing because I don't, you know, if I'd asked her, I don't think she probably thinks I ever had a, a problem with drinking. But for me, it was a problem because I, it was just uh, something that did not sit well with me. So actually being accountable to someone and a dear friend that I have, I wrote him an email one evening. And as soon as I'd hit the send button, I just, it, it wasn't quite a euphoria, but I felt so, you know, I just felt something completely different had changed then because I'd sent this message to him saying, Basically, you know, I'm not going to talk about this, but this is what I've done. You know why. Um, and I got a lovely message of support back from him. And that, to me, that was the start of this thing. And that's probably why I, I hung on to that for so long. It's just that feeling of being accountable. Um, although it, it isn't so much a case now, but in those early days, being accountable to someone else to give me confidence to then have the conversation with other people including my wife, including my friends, about why I decided to change my relationship. I want to acknowledge and kind of reflect back some of what you've said, because I think it's important. When I said, what was the thing, you know, that, that kept you anchored? You said a belief in, you know, that it was the right thing for you, that it was guiding you to your authentic self, um, telling someone, as you just elaborated on, kind of the sense of accountability and having somebody else be able to support you. One thing that I think people will be really interested to know, especially somebody else who might be curious themselves or also be facing this in their lives, what did you hold on to? What was the thing you wanted that you held on to that allowed you to stay convicted and stay true to this, this that you were creating for yourself? Yeah. Um, a combination of things, really. I think if there was one thing I wanted to hold on to, it was the confirmation that I could do this. Yeah. And because it, yeah, and as we develop the story, we'll, we'll talk about my, my you know, more recent activities around helping other people. But it was one of the, uh, it appears to be one of the most difficult things to do is to make a decision that seems so logically easy and how hard that is when you've made that decision or you're making that decision. So for me, having made the decision, it was sort of almost a binary thing. It's either yes or no. And I, it was like, I, I'm strong enough to hold on to this decision because it's what I know is right for me. And what I'm hearing you also describe is not a lot of thinking. It's a lot of feeling. It's a lot of tuning in to your your gut, your intuition, your instinct, whatever you want to call it. Like these things that you're describing aren't, well, I sat down and, you know, wrote out a five-step plan and then, you know, set some dates and times. I'm guessing that might have been part of your process as well. But what you're really sharing with us is deep knowing. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, as a project manager, you'd expect me to have a project plan for this, but I don't. Um, you're very, you know, you're spot on there, Paul. It, it is about feelings. And though my ability to recognize those feelings has increased dramatically uh, in the three years, because it, I think it's those feelings that drive me now. It's what I feel is right. Whereas, you know, previously, may, maybe alcohol sort of just numb those things out. Uh, maybe maybe I had a reason to do that. I'm sure I'm on a journey to discover what that's all about. Uh, I have some inklings about that, but it's you know it's still in my early thoughts. But I think suppressing my feelings is probably something that I've done very well for a number of years. And when I got to this point where you don't have this the ability to numb those things out or just take that sort of those thoughts and those feelings away. You know, now I, I can do, I can feel very comfortable with those feelings now and let them guide me. You know, that's really powerful. 
because what I'm hearing you say is that I'm inferring here. So bear with me. Right. And you and I both, we've both been through the same journey. So I've been, I'm putting some of my own experience in here, but let me just summarize for the sake of those who are listening, the feelings that you drank away are the very thing that you leaned into when you put the drink away. Yeah. It's powerful that which that which breaks us can build us right absolutely absolutely and uh, yeah i think it's a a journey um that i'm on you know i'm i'm starting it and it's something that i know you know um i've got a lot of work to do on that but it's something that i'm really enthusiastic and i'm really sort of proud that i've done that 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 pride is quite it's reflected by my friends and my family now you know now they've all got to the point where they know there's no question of of well why have you done that but you know they're all proud of what i've done which you know is, is gone on not just to stop drinking but also to go on and help others by coaching people who want to give up or change the relationship with alcohol so that pride has been reflected from from my family on many occasions which is something that again resonates with my sort of feelings as well Tony, let's let's jump into the next question here, which is, you know, what have you learned about yourself? What did you learn about yourself as a result of sitting on this or these commas? Well, let's let's talk about the the most recent one, you know, the the, the quitting alcohol, because I think that's the most profound. And I've just discovered who I was meant to be. Uh, I think, you know, all the things that I feel about other people and myself now. Are the things that I probably they're the values that I grew up with, but somehow lost along the way. And I won't say that alcohol took all of those away from me, because you know, growing up, having a family, you know, working in business, all of those things can erode your values. I mean, you know, if you if you allow them to. Uh, and I think you know, I, you know, probably that was the case for me. And I'm now you know, discovering that those values are really what I meant, what I was meant to be. And they sit so well with me, and I see the world in a completely different way than I did when I was uh, working, you know, with some of the top companies in the UK and trying to build my business. It's a different world now, and I'm seeing and enjoying that through different eyes. That's that sounds powerful. What would what would you say is your favorite new experience that you've acquired as a result of this? It's it's really sort of very simple. It's driving home at night and watching the blue light go flashing past you without worry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is in, indeed a privilege, is it not? On so many levels, but on this particular level, we're talking about alcohol-free, right? Yeah, no, it, I mean, I, that might sound a bit trite, but that, you know, it's, it's the freedom that, that's associated with that, the freedom to be able to... You know, when the 16-year-old granddaughter rings up, you know, at 12 o'clock at night saying, can you come and pick me up because I'm in a bit of a mess or I I can do that, you know. And that freedom Mm -hmm. to do the things that I think is right whenever they, they, you know, occur, that's something that, you know, just... It's a great feeling, you know, to be able to say yes to everyone. And and yet it's not right. It's not such a small thing, right? Because as someone who, or for anyone who likes to enjoy alcohol and enjoy drinks, whether it's wine or whatever in the evening and so forth, it, it, even if you're enjoying your alcohol, if you have any sense of responsibility, you know, you're not going to be driving after the first glass, right? And so- yeah. If you enjoy alcohol more than one night a week, I mean, there's more than one night a year a week that you know you can't be driving. And if you are driving and you have any sense of responsibility, you're also worried about whether or not you're going to get in trouble or harm someone. So it, that's not a small thing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not. And I, you know, yeah, let's just be clear here. I'm, I'm not painting alcohol as the villain in this piece at all. And I'm not saying to suggesting to anyone that you know they should give up. But as you just said that, Paul, one one episode came back to my life is when my mother passed away and it was a Sunday evening. And as usual on a Sunday evening, we'd find our Sunday that evening meal and I probably drank a bottle of wine with that and a couple of days. And I got a call to say she'd fallen over and I had to drive up to the Midlands knowing full well that I was way over the top. And, you know, that 
it, it doesn't haunt me, but it, I can still remember it. And it just, you know, that felt wrong. And, you know, mum's mm. happy passed the next day, but at least I got to see her before that happened. But, you know, that that's the sort of thing, I suppose, my, my sort of, uh, my blue light incident, that's probably the one that uh, I wish I didn't have to have done. Yeah. And yet, thank you for sharing that because it takes courage to admit these things. We all have our own stories. You know, I'm not sitting over here in judgment. I, I could share stories too, but it's not my episode. But I think I think what's important there is to recognize that, you know, you have the option to look back on that with regret and shame. And instead you're looking back on it with observation and noticing and and learning, right? Yeah. And also feeling comfortable to share that with people as an example. Yep. So, Tony, what has changed for you as a result of sitting on this comma? Well, you know, if we're talking about the, the sort of relationship with alcohol, the fact that, you know, I personally, you know, now have moved forward in that, that in itself is a change. I've got more money. Unfortunately, I've, I've invested that money in a, an obsession with buying old minis, but you know that's that's another thing. But mm. I, out of that, I've got a lot more freedom of the things I can do and not do, uh, and that's been a challenge. Be you know the things that you normally do with friends uh, being quite interesting. That's all settled down now, and from you know people wondering, has Tony got a problem? Or was I a bit weird to actually now being accepted as something that quite a number and a growing number of people are doing now? I think it you know, has been something that I'm feeling more comfortable with. Talk a little bit more about that, Tony. So you said I've got a lot more freedom, and then there was a little bit of hesitation there because you you were alluding to how other people perceive you and 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 what options you have with other people. Kind of dig a little deeper into that. Where were you going? Well, I, well, I guess, you know, the, the freedoms I feel now, because there's a, a generally a, a greater acceptance that people who don't drink alcohol aren't weird in some way. Um, mm. That's a whole new set of freedoms that just feels so much more empowering now. The ability to go into pretty much in the UK, the alcohol free industry is, is pretty, you know, up there. Um, there are not many pubs and bars that you go into now that don't serve a variety of alcohol free whereas three years ago it was a, a different different thing altogether but that sort of uh, ability now to go to any location and order a drink that you know is not going to be warm orange or coca-cola or something full of sugar that's encouraging and the whole social structure around that for me has changed quite dramatically whether it's because my friends have all understood in their own way not that i've had to explain to any of them but maybe they've come to terms with that in their own way that tony doesn't drink anymore it's it, it's just it's so enlightening for me that i can sit in a around a dinner table as I did last Friday and watch the people I love and care for telling me the same stories over and over again that I've heard probably three times that evening, let alone before. But actually, I can sit there and take all that in uh, and process it in the way I can now rather than the way I couldn't do before. Um, so you know, for me, I'm actually beginning to recognize some of the... Um, mm some of the strengths and the, the the things in my friends that perhaps I didn't before, even though I've known them for 20, 30 years. You know, it's uh, it, it's quite interesting just to observe people when you're not, um, you know, not on your second glass of Chardonnay or whatever your particular version of poison is. Well, okay. So before we go to the last question, though, I kind of want to acknowledge something overall that I'm seeing. So if we take what you shared in your first scenario about your business from, you know, the 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 meltdown in the housing crisis and then and then add to that, you know, the experience with giving up alcohol or rather quitting drinking and returning to sobriety in 2020 and then all of these things that you've described in the meantime, I see this overarching theme of being able to let go. Yeah. I get you described in 2010, you know, you were holding on, holding on, but when you let go, you, you let go and you had to move quickly. And then it took you three years to let go of the relationship that you wanted to end with alcohol. And then 
And then all these other things you're describing, it's kind of like, yeah, people say this, or this happens at the holidays or what have you. And I see you just letting go of that without even attempting to hold on to it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that sort of returns to this thing you know, of making decisions quickly is not only whether it takes three years or not, but having made the decision, I don't go back. It's not that I think the decision is never wrong, but I just think that, you know, if I've made a decision, then it, it doesn't serve me to keep thinking about what I might have done or what might have happened. You know, I'm moving forward rather than looking backwards because it just seems to me that you can always question your decisions if you choose to. But if you've made a decision, you shouldn't need to. It's, you know, it, for me personally, I very rarely question those things. Well, it doesn't mean to say I haven't got thoughts, anxieties, and, and, you know, have some, some things about my past that I wish I hadn't done, but I can't change those. They're not things that I have any power to change. And in my sort of decision making, it's the same now. So once I've made a decision, whatever it is, I don't need, I don't need to get hung up on what people think about that or the, the challenges that might come to that because I've, I've just made the decision to move on. And I know that there'll be another decision to make and another pause or what have you. But you, you know, instead of considering, and it, it sort of is a bit of a, I suppose it's a, it's a bit at odds with this whole thing when you go back to what I do professionally, which is about consensus seeking. If you spend too much time getting consensus, mm. you can probably just end up doing nothing. And so there's a balance to, that I find. Yes, I want to bring people with me, both in my personal and, prior and, and professional life. But if I can't, I'll make a decision and I won't therefore question myself going forward. And if people, I'm intelligent enough to listen to robust uh, challenges um, and I won't necessarily argue in my corner unnecessarily. But, you know, if there's a logic to how I arrive at a decision, why I make them, then I'm comfortable with that personally. That So I don't need to challenge myself and let others do that and, and be comfortable with it. Well, and I hear you say that the context matters. And if we're talking about in the workplace, then there's more variables that are going to affect your ability to do that. But in your personal life, you get to make those decisions. I mean, that's the whole point of autonomy. Absolutely. Tony, last question here. What does getting off the comma look like for you? Well, for me, in the context of the, you know, the, the new uh, relationship with alcohol, it, it just means a huge amount uh, for me. It's changed my life personally, and it's changed my view of what I need to do with other people. I guess it sort of coalesced with some other things that were going on in my life. As I'm approaching the age when most people stop working, I'm acutely aware I have experience that other people haven't. And I think it's true of professional and, and private life. And it seems to me a great shame of not sharing that experience with people to the benefit of people. It's not about, you know, trying to tell younger people that, you know, I've done it all before. So, you know, listen to me, but it's about sharing that experience so that people can benefit from it. So I have professionally been coaching and mentoring people for about the last three or four years in a workplace. So when the opportunity came along to retrain as a sober coach and take the experiences that I had um, of the last three years out to the benefit of others, it just seemed the absolutely logical and uh, right thing to do for me. And that's why, you know, back in January of this year and how you and I came to, to become associated with each other, um, I decided to retrain um, as a sober coach and start working with people that are stuck on, you know, actually, you know, stuck themselves with this huge decision in their lives about whether or not they should maintain their relationship with alcohol or not. And that is just a just a whole different ball game for me because it's it's not work. It's a passion I have. It's a value I've got. And you know it's something that I just get immense benefit value out of. 
and enjoyment out of by helping other people uh, become unstuck. So I don't know that I'm I'm stuck on a I'm stuck at the moment. I'm sure there will be occasions when I will get stuck, but I think uh, helping others to do that helps me make those decisions more quickly as well. Well, what I'm hearing you say is, regardless of when you're stuck, I mean, in particular with these two scenarios getting off the comma means getting unstuck in whatever way that looks like, but also sharing the experience, giving other people an opportunity to learn from, from what you've been through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, I I sometimes think now, isn't that what we're here for Uh, as, as, as human beings, despite all the nonsense that's going on in the world at the moment, and will continue to go on. Isn't our real value to help other people? You know, that mm-hmm. where we get fulfillment and they get benefit and fulfillment as well. Because it sure as hell feels like that at the moment. Uh, for me personally, yeah. it feels like, you know, I am getting the best value out of my life, the best fulfillment out of my life because I'm helping others. That sounds really powerful. Tony, what would you acknowledge yourself for right now? That's a challenge because <laughs> none of us like to admit what we get. Well, I know it yourself. I I think I've become or am becoming a much more tolerant family man. Uh, I'm not saying I was intolerant before. I'm I'm growing into a role as a grandfather that I feel really really comfortable with, and so being able to do that. And for all the circumstances that come together, you know, like, like having four boys and having them having children and then having the time to, to benefit from that and to, to benefit them as well. That's, that's what I think I would acknowledge myself for is, you know, just actually being more comfortable and more uh, accessible as, as that sort of person in their lives. Which seems like it fits into this theme of, again, being able to share your experiences. Absolutely. It seems to me. I mean, I, I met up with my son in his, in his 40s yesterday. So he lives in Devon, which is about a three-hour drive from us. We met up halfway, and we just spent time talking. And he said to me you know, in his WhatsApp message later last night, that, what I really love, Dad, is we can talk for hours. And that, I just think, is one of the things that I either didn't have time for or didn't feel the need for. But I now can you know, mm. give time to not only my family, but others that feel I need it. That sounds very meaningful. And I'm sure they value that as well. Yeah, I think that's the thing about that has been reflected in feedback I've had from them, which is, you know, probably the most powerful when you when your sons tell you they're proud of you and they love you for that. Mm. I just think that that's something that you know I couldn't have dreamed of, um, and I think you know it's so precious now. Yeah, wow that that sounds that's very moving, and that sounds like that has to be extremely impactful for you. Mm. Tony, let's let's land this plane. So tell us where can people find you and how could they get in touch with you? Well, uh, and, you know, the, the sort of new alcohol free Tony can be found at sober60.com. And that's where my story is in more detail than the one I've told today, and also the opportunity to work with me or for me to work with with other people. Uh, that's where they can find out what I do, how to contact me. It's all there. There will be in the show notes. There'll be other contacts in there as well. But uh, that's the way to find me. Uh, I'm on socials, but you know, it's over sixty in, in uh, LinkedIn and on Facebook will find me as well. Yes, and we will have this in the show notes. And then also, as with every guest, I give you an opportunity to acknowledge other individuals or organizations that might be meaningful or important to you, and and lift up others and boost them. So, who would you like to acknowledge today? Well, I guess, you know, the, the thing that really changed the way I, I thought about my relationship with alcohol was when I came across Jenny Lee Grace's Sober Club. So the soberclub.com is is something that uh, I've been involved with since it started, um, which is over, you know, around about three years or so now. So Janie's I've worked with for a number of years. I think that's something that is quite significant in my journey towards sobriety. 
but um, I also, you know, the, the books that I refer to in the show notes are also, you know, important to me uh, as well. But the, the working with, with Janie and Sober Club has led us into this, this new area of sober coaching, which uh, Paul, you and I uh, have been talking about for a while, about getting sober guys talking, which is something that we want to do more of because guys just don't talk um they don't talk enough to talk you know about anything but let alone uh the challenges they're having with alcohol so the sober you know the sober guys is something that we'll see more of as the year continues and um you know details that can be found on, on the sober 60 website as well Tony, thank you for joining us and for sharing of your story and your experience holding true with exactly what you said is important and valuable to you now, right? Here you are sharing your experience and and giving us some insight into, you know, your own uh, life and allowing people to take from that things that might be inspiring or, or helpful for them as well. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, Paul. What an honor it is to witness these stories from these amazing human beings, and today's guest was no exception. I invite you to think about what you learned from this conversation. What stood out for you? What challenged you? What inspired you? And I encourage you to write it down in some form of journaling and reflection. I can't tell you how magical it can be to set aside your expectations and just let your thoughts flow out of your head and onto paper. You don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to do anything with it, but you can be amazed at what comes out of your thoughts and onto paper and what that can do for you. I know freestyle journaling has been a powerful practice in my life for a very long time. You just never know what you might discover about yourself. Thank you for listening to this episode of Off The Comma. Follow me on social media at Off The Comma and also look for upcoming workshops and events at offthecomma.com or better yet, go to offthecomma.com and sign up for my mailing list and let me bring the news directly to you. I am passionate about keeping this podcast ad free so that we create a safe container for people to be able to tell their stories uninterrupted by commercials and promotions. I currently cover all the production costs and I'm happy to continue doing so. And I'm also open to and appreciative of any donations that anyone would like to contribute. This is nothing more than to be able to support the podcast and cover some of the monthly editing and producing and equipment costs that are associated with this podcast. So look for the donations link in the podcast descriptions wherever you find this podcast. Be sure to like this episode, follow the podcast, and more importantly, spread the good word. If you were moved by today's conversation, pass it along to someone you care about. As always, keep noticing.